in our last Jumu'ah together, we discussed the fact that greatness does not just fall in your lap. And if it does, it usually slips through the cracks unless you gear up for it beforehand, unless you work for it in preparation. It doesn't come to those who don't work for it. It isn't claimed by those who haven't put in the discipline and the work and the effort for it. What we did not say last Friday is that when greatness does come though, it comes in all different shapes and sizes. It's very interesting and wise, profound, how the Prophet ﷺ would constantly separate for the Sahaba the notion of greatness with the notion of popularity. It's not always the same thing. In one instance, he saw a man that was reputable in the towns and he said to them, what do you think of this man? They say, this man, when he speaks, he's listened to. And when he intercedes, he steps in to help someone. They always accept and respect his requests. And when he proposes to a family, any family opens the door wide open for him. And at a later time, he asked them, what do you think of this man? They said, this man, he's a nobody. He speaks, nobody listens. If he intercedes, he's dismissed. When he proposes, everyone shuts the door in his face. No family wants to build bonds with him. He said to them, well, this second man is worth so much more he is even superior to a, an earth's load of the first man. It's not what you think. And I was uh, recollecting recently, maybe a perfect example for this, is a great imam and scholar and pioneer of Islam 1,200 years ago that unless you're specialized in the Islamic sciences, you may never hear of. But those who know, know. And this was the great legend of Muslim Spain of Andalusia, Al Imam Baqi ibn Makhlad. Baqi ibn Makhlad, may Allah have mercy on his soul. This man traveled twice. He left home twice to collect the Sunnah, to collect the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ and bring them home to his people. Those two trips accounted for 34 years of his life. The first trip was 20 years, the second trip was 14 years roaming the earth, corner to corner, if you will. Much of that journey was even on foot, on foot. And among those trips or the segments of that lifelong journey was when he finally was able to reach Baghdad. And Baghdad at the time was the powerhouse of the Sunnah, the powerhouse of Hadith, a stronghold. And so as soon as he gets there, his dream of meeting Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal is shattered. They tell him, no, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal is not available. He's under house arrest. He's not allowed to teach anyone anymore. And his heart is broken. He goes to basically the equivalent of a motel, drops his bags off and heads for the masjid. He gets to the masjid, he sees these huge crowds of high caliber students and teachers. And in the biggest crowd, he sees everyone asking this one man. He asks them, who is this man? They say, this is Yahya ibn Ma'in the lifelong partner of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. Yahya ibn Ma'in was specialized within hadith, particularly on al-jarh wa ta'deel, which is narrator evaluation. The way Allah preserved the sunnah for us so that we could understand the Quran, so that we could live by Islam, is that every single narrator that we take a hadith from, there's like a portfolio for them. They're under investigation, and the fewer and the better people in the chain, the more reliable the hadith is for us, right? And so this was a person specialized in that sub-discipline, subset of the hadith sciences. He was a, a living legend. So he made his way up to the front and everyone's asking him questions. What about this person from that country and this person from that country? He says to him, listen, I'm not from around here. Please, let me get some priority. Let me get my questions in. You'll be around tomorrow. So they let him and he asks question after question till they tell him enough, enough. We want our chance. He says, okay, one more question. What about Ahmad ibn Hanbal, Imam Ahmad? So Yahya ibn Ma'in said, what? You ask me to evaluate Ahmad? You ask me about ah Ahmad is asked about us. We don't grade him. He grades everybody. And he, he was bent at that point. I have to meet him. I don't care. And so he asked, where does he live? And he made his way to the house of Imam Ahmad himself. Rahimahullah. He knocks on his door. The Imam comes to the door. 
he says to him, Ana talibu hadith. I am a seeker. I trek the globe seeking a hadith. And I've come to you from very far away lands to learn the hadith directly from you. I don't want any middlemen, <laughs> directly from you. And so Imam Ahmed says to him, far like where? And then Imam Ahmed suggested or asked about the farthest place imaginable to him. He said to him, Africa? Are you from Africa? So Baqi ibn Makhlad says to him, I have to cross the ocean to get to Africa. Like Africa is a pit stop en route to Baghdad. So the Imam says to him, You really are from far away. And there is nothing more beloved to me than to fulfill this need of yours, to learn the ahadith from me, but you may have heard of what I'm going through. The persecution and the house arrest and all of these uh, limitations put on me, I am not allowed. He said to him, I heard, and I don't care. <laughs> we can be slick about it. I'll come to you every single day dressed like a beggar. I'll dress myself in rags and an oily turban, and I'll come to your door saying, Fi sabilillah, give me something for Allah. Give me something for Allah, and I'll keep it brief. Give, you come to the door as if you're giving me some money or some food. Give me one hadith, two hadith, and I'll walk away. I promise. So Imam Ahmad, he folded. He said, fine, I'll do it. On one condition that you not attend any classes in any masjid. Because if you start attending, people are going to catch who you are. Then you're a student of hadith coming to my house. It's all over. You're going to have to be satisfied and settle for one or two a hadith a day. And he did that. He accepted the, the stipulation. Eventually, as time went by, the uh, al-wathiq, the, 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 the caliph of the time, one of those who was among the, the inquisitors, those who held the inquisition and the persecution, he finally dies. And every persecutor is bound to die. And al-mutawakkil uh, al takes the reins and he basically removes everything. And Imam Ahmad is reinstated and he becomes even more famous than before. And when he gets into the masjid, he clears out a spot in every gathering for Baqi ibn Makhla to come sit next to him. And he says, this is the most deserving person on earth of the title Talibu Ilm, a true seeker of sacred knowledge. This guy was relentless. No, none of you know him, but he was relentless. And then one time, even while in Baghdad, Baqi ibn Makhlad became sick and stopped attending. Imam Ahmad asked, where is Al-Imam? Where is Imam Baqi? They said, He's, he can't get out of his room. So he walks over to the hotel where he's in. And Imam Baqi says, I hear a huge clamor, like there's a riot outside. But I'm laying down, I can't get up. Suddenly the knocks on my door, open the door, it's Imam Ahmad himself visiting me. And behind him is the planet. Everybody, there's a whole crowd behind, behind him, pens and papers in hand, wanting to record the exchange. What's going to happen between Imam Ahmad and Baqi ibn Makhl? And he made some dua for him, some prayers for him, and he left. And then everyone in the motel realized, oh man, we have like a, a huge wali of Allah, someone very close to God on our hands. And they start just unloading gifts on him. Money and food and blankets and he becomes like a celebrity. But eventually he was on a mission. The mission was not to be popular, it was not to be a celebrity. He leaves Baghdad and he goes home. He goes home and he says that I have in my time back home, before he died, he said, I have planted in these lands, in Muslim Spain, things, meaning teachings of Islam, teachings of the Sunnah, teachings of the Muhammadan way, that will not be able, no one will be able to uproot them until a Dajjal comes out, until the end of time. And he was. The two greatest scholars who pioneered Islam's teachings in that region, Yes, politically it was a Muslim land, but the teachings of the Sunnah were credited originally to two people in Muslim Spain. Baqi ibn Makhlat and Muhammad ibn, uh, Muhammad ibn Waddah al-Qurtubi, rahimahumallah. What's interesting also though, not just did he run from celebrity in Baghdad, but he put together historically the largest compilation of hadith in the history of Islam. It's called the Musnad of Baqi ibn Makhlad. 
Unfortunately, that transcript or that manuscript has been lost. We don't have it anymore. But its impact remains throughout the lands, remains throughout the generations, remains and was inherited by so many scholars. And so this was a great, but he was invisible for the most part. That will never take away from him the reward, the celebrity, the honor and glory of doing what he could in whatever little bit of opportunity he was given. May we all be the same. Allahumma ameen. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah al-azim ali wa lakum. Alhamdulillah wahda wa salatu wa salamu ala man la nabiya ba'da ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika lah wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa nabiyuhu wa rasooluh. And so the rule should never be forgotten. This golden principle that the greats, when we speak about greatness, are not only those most visible on the world stage. In fact, even among Muslims, some of the most visible on the world stage will be the first to enter the hellfire. May we never be of them. Didn't he say, sallallahu alayhi wa the first three to enter the fire will be a scholar and a warrior and a, a donor that were insincere, that just did it for the fame? So that removed them from the rank of the greats, even though in terms of this world they were among the ranks of the popular. Greats can be greats even if they're invisible to most. And they can be the most impactful even in this world, even if their names and their marks are forgotten. You know, it's not just the prophets also that were like minorities in their people and had great impact. You think about the Qur'an, how many times the Qur'an captures for you people whose names we don't know, whose story we don't know, but they're sort of just like mentioned there. Like Allah wanted to immortalize their mention. Why? As an inspiration for us. You could be in the grander scheme of things, a margin in the story, but with Allah, you're something else. Go to Surah Yasin. What do we know about the man in Surah Yasin? That he came running from the end of town and he said, Ya qawmi tabi'ul mursaleen. He wasn't a prophet or messenger. He directed them, hey guys, don't ignore the prophets and messengers. Don't you dare. So Allah told us about him. Why? Because that is, that is us. All of us have that opportunity. You go to Surah Al-Ma'idah. Long conversation. Musa is telling Banu Israel, enter the promised land. No, there's tyrants in there and so on and so forth. Then Allah says, two men who had the fear of God, in, it's an invisible quality, right? Stood up and said, just listen to Musa. Just walk in. Allah will give you victory. Why? Why are these things mentioned in passing? Because many of those who passed unnoticed in this world are true giants in the sight of Allah Azza wa Jal. You know, you even think about the da'wah in, in world history. Who exactly was it? who brought Islam to the subcontinent of, Inge of India? Who brought it? Who exactly were they who put tens of millions of Muslims there in China after Allah's permission, right? Who is it exactly who brought Islam to the Americas? Even on an individual level, who is it that gave Malcolm X or Siraj Wahaj? Or who, who is it? Do you know their names? Who gave them their shahada? And they step forward and they... They put Islam on their shoulders. They put a generation on their shoulders and say, get on, I'll carry you. Who did that? Their names are forgotten, but not with Allah Azza wa Jal. Who are the people nowadays in this masjid? I know some of them. Most people don't. They have full-time jobs and they have big families and they get up at 3 a.m. They get up at 4 a.m. Hours before Fajr sometimes to make sure the persecution of the Muslims doesn't go unnoticed. That the world doesn't just hear what the news cycle will quickly flash at you to remain awake, to remain aware, to remain cognizant of the propagandas, of the misinformation, of the brutality, of the people that are downtrodden and need our resources. Who are those people? These are not just people who were warriors for a moment of bravery. These are people who lived for Allah. And those are greater warriors many a times than those who died for Allah in one instance. And think of every single parent. What a jihad it is to basically be Maqib ibn Makhlad in your house. 
I only gonna get one chance or two a day to give my advice or take something from my kids. I, I can't do shortcuts. I sort of have to tread with caution for years on end. Those are giants in Allah's eyes. And that is why, and I will close with this actually, that is why in Surah At-Tur, there is an ayah that we should pay attention to. When Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَاتَّبَعَتْهُمْ ذُرِّيَّتُهُمْ بِإِيمَانٍ أَلْحَقْنَا بِهِمْ ذُرِّيَّتَهُمْ Those who have faith, strong conviction in Allah, belief, and their offspring follow them in faith, meaning the moms and dads out there, who are in faith and they work to, for their kids to follow them, stay believers, a generation and two and ten later. Allah says, I will allow their offspring to catch up with them. Why doesn't it say, I'll put them on the higher level, whoever is higher. I'll make a reunion for the family at the highest level of each of them, or the single highest level among them, because those parents can't be beaten. Their greatness can't be reached. Because everything they did, the generations after them do them, that will elevate them as well. So you can't catch them. And so Allah is saying, I will just let you be at your parents' level, even though you will never be able to catch them. That is greatness in the hereafter. Greatness in the ranks of paradise, between every two levels of 500 year distance, and they're light years ahead of us all. May Allah bless our parents, and bless us as parents, and bless our activists and workers, and give liberation and peace and tranquility, and justice to all the Muslims in every corner of the world. May Allah bless our scholars, those that we know and those that we don't. May Allah Azza wa Jal send His finest peace and blessings upon His messengers, those we know and those we don't. May Allah immortalize our legacy in the heavens, even if it is, goes obscure in the earth. Allahumma ameen.